डॉक्टर बाबा साहेब आंबेडकर ओपन यूनिवर्सिटी हेलो फ्रेंड्स इन द प्रीवियस प्रेजेंटेशन वी लुक्ड एट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ लैंग्वेज इन दिस प्रेजेंटेशन वी आर गोइंग टू लुक एट द हिस्ट्री ऑफ लैंग्वेज स्टडीज वेन यू डिस्कस लैंग्वेज एज सच यू डिस्कस कॉन्सेप्ट लाइक वॉट इज लैंग्वेज हाउ डज इट कम इन टू एग्जिस्टेंस हाउ डज इट चेंज वॉट हैपन्स टू लैंग्वेज इज अक्रॉस टाइम अक्रॉस जियोग्राफी एंड सो ऑन बट अवर कंसर्न नाउ is to understand language studies as it evolves across time so we will look at the different traditions of language studies the main traditions that we are going to look at here are the indian tradition the western tradition during the ancient and medieval ages and the modern period and the present situation the present context of language education language studies okay so let us begin with the tradition in india it is not because we are the baba saheb ambedkar open university is located in india that we are looking at the history of language studies from indian point of view in fact historically in the history of mankind india happens to be the place where language studies evolved for the first time any other language of the world was not studied in such an ancient time that sanskrit was studied in india the indian tradition begins with the father of language studies called panini panini was the father of linguistics as such he lived in 400 bc that is 400 years before christ panini lived in the north western part of india and he has recorded the indian tradition of language studies in the sense that he has talked about he has discussed eight grammarians before panini that is for several years for more than several centuries before 400 bc language studies was taken up as a serious academic discipline in india in any case we have panini's work which is called ashtadhyayi ashtadhyayi is the epitome the earliest grammar of any language existing in the world panini wrote ashtadhyayi as a grammar in eight chapters ashta is eight in sanskrit adhyaya is a chapter ashtadhyayi therefore is now available as the first grammar of any human language to us and there are 4000 shlokas or sutras these 4000 rules of grammar discuss various aspects 
like the phonetics and phonology of Sanskrit language, the morphology of Sanskrit language, the vocabulary of Sanskrit language, and the syntax, syntactical patterns of Sanskrit language. Therefore, it is natural to say that Panini was the first grammarian, Panini was the first linguist who produced descriptive linguistics and rules of language studies much before anywhere else in the world language studies started. As a result of this, there was a great influence on the Indian subcontinent because Panini's work was useful. It resulted in standardization of Sanskrit language. India, as you know, is a subcontinent, is a large geographical expanse. And naturally, the language spoken in different parts of India and a language that was spoken in 400 BC and which continues to be spoken today, Sanskrit language, will have different forms. It will evolve. It will change. In our last presentation, we saw that language is a living phenomenon, living being and it keeps changing across time, across geography. Language variation, therefore, is a natural phenomena. But Panini created a grammar of Sanskrit which helped in standardization of the use of Sanskrit language. Now, there were various socio-political groups across India. There were different kingdoms and empires across India, across this period of time. But Sanskrit language in its standardized form became the vehicle of communication and therefore a national discourse came into being. People in different parts of India could communicate with each other easily because of the existence of this standardized version of Sanskrit language. So Panini's contribution should be understood not only in terms of father of language studies, not only because he was the first grammarian, not only as a person who studied Sanskrit language and who created descriptive linguistics, but also as a person who contributed to the emergence of national discourse. And in a sense, at that time, this national discourse also transcended the boundaries of India of that period. We will see how this happened. So the Sanskrit tradition of language studies provided a comprehensive and scientific theory of grammar and it was appreciated by people living in various parts of the world at that time. But even today, it is appreciated by modern linguists all over the world. Standardization of Sanskrit, as I said, made the language, Sanskrit language, the Indian language of learning and literature for something like 2,000 years. That standardized form of Sanskrit language made it possible to have a discourse across the continent 
and it was not only religious discourse it was a secular discourse because texts in health science ayurveda texts in economics artha shastra and texts in various disciplines academic disciplines were created in sanskrit and it became possible for people living in different parts of india primarily but also different parts of the world to study these texts because they were created in a standardized form of sanskrit language now why am i saying this because we know that international students of language international students of religion international students of various sciences like astronomy like health science like economics and politics they came to indian universities and we take three examples right now we will take the example of takshashila or taxila as one university that was the first university that came into existence then we take the example of nalanda which came to be the second important center international center of learning and we will take the example of valbi which also was a major center of learning situated in gujarat these universities taught religious texts of course but they also taught secular disciplines and secular texts each of these universities had very large libraries and for students coming to these universities it was important that they access these libraries to be able to do that these students had to learn sanskrit or pali these were the two major languages of the time after the vedic literature in india the more important literature that came into existence is called the upanishadic literature the upanishadic literature was written in sanskrit and buddhist literature was written in pali tripitaka the original buddhist document was written in pali therefore scholars coming from various parts of the world to takshashila nalanda and vallabhi had to study sanskrit and pali to be able to access these texts these scholars came and lived on these campuses they studied they read the texts and they also copied the texts the manuscripts were created by them so that they can take the text back to their own country their own religious center their own political kingdom so these are religious and secular disciplines which were studied and taught in these um, universities there is the most famous uh, fictional narrative um epitome is called katha sarit sagara and katha sarit sagara narrates the story of a brahmin who would rather send his son to vallabhi than to nalanda or banaras the university vallabhi university as i said existed in gujarat um it attracted scholars from across the world and the chinese scholar huan sang who came here in the later half of 7th century ad 
has written in detail, he has given uh, an account of how 6,000 scholars lived in Vallabhi in different monasteries. Yuan Sang also visited Nalanda, which was created before Vallabhi actually. Nalanda came into existence in 3rd century BC and it continued to be in existence in 7th century AD when Huan Sang visited it. Nalanda is a place in modern state of Bihar in North India. And even today, Nalanda is now recreated. It is rejuvenated in the form of an international university. But in those days, it is said that something like 20,000 scholars from different parts of the world came and lived in Nalanda. And there were teachers of Sanskrit, teachers of Pali, teachers of Buddhism, teachers of health science, Ayurveda, teachers of economics, which was also created in the 4th century BC. The economics text was created by Chanakya in 4th century BC. These texts were studied by the scholars. And as I said, the tradition of language studies was greatly helped by the work of Panini because Panini had given a descriptive linguistic account of how Sanskrit language existed at that time and how it should be used. It was a descriptive grammar and it also became a prescriptive grammar for scholars in these Indian universities. Takshashila was the earliest university, as I said, it is now part of Pakistan. It was at that time northwestern part of India, where the rich Kashmiri tradition of language studies, including the tradition of Panini, took place in Takshashila. And there were great scholars of various sciences whose names, whose texts are even today um, studied by people in India, which happened in Takshashila at that time. The Western tradition um, started in 500 AD about 1,000 years after Panini. But um, the West also had a very rich tradition beginning with the Latin grammarian Priscian. Of course, Priscian has also mentioned works in Latin grammar that came into existence before him. But those works are lost. Like Panini has talked about grammarians before him, but those grammars are lost. Priscian's grammar of Latin and later grammars of Greek language were very close to each other. The two languages are close to each other and therefore the grammar traditions are also close to each other. Basically, it studies language in terms of parts of speech. What is a noun? What is a verb? What is an adjective? What is an adverb? And so on. Different parts of speech are studied. And this, as we can see today, became the cornerstone of language studies in Europe. The Latin model 
was accepted for English and for other European languages. Therefore, Latin, which was the language of the Roman Empire, became a model for modern European languages. And the Latin tradition of language studies became a model for traditions of language studies in modern European countries. The Western universities today are very rich in language studies. In fact, the Indian tradition started by Panini and continued by several scholars for hundreds of years was lost at some point of time and the Western tradition in the Western universities became a dominant tradition as we understand modern linguistics today. So the Western model of language studies should be understood by us. On our part, we will look at the tradition of English language studies in the West and in other parts of the world in the next presentation. But to sum up this presentation, we should comment on, once again, the phenomenon of globalization globalization of communication and therefore global, globalization of language studies. The existence of English as a global language is important because English is largely the language of computer science today. English is largely the language of mass communication today. And the artificial intelligence, which is seen as the future of all scholarship in our universities, which is seen as an important part of global developments, artificial intelligence also exists today mainly in English language. It doesn't have to be in any one language. Across some centuries in future, it will, of course, come into existence in many languages of the world. But as on today, because of globalization, because of global communication patterns, because of our interest in artificial intelligence, language studies has united the world like never before. And the Sanskrit saying, Vasudheva Kutumbakam, the entire world is one family. Vasudheva Kutumbakam can be realized today if we look at how English language is uniting the world by global communication and by global patterns of academic discourse. Therefore, I think it is equally important for us to understand not only the history of language, but the history of language studies in the world. And that is how we will be able to understand the history of English language and English language studies in the coming presentations. Thank you. Swadhyaya